the Lorax. How the Grinch stole Christmas. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Oh, to places you'll go. The cat in the hat. Green eggs and ham. Dr. Seuss might just be the most influential writer in all children's literature. His Seussian style of dialogue and doodles have cemented him into our minds, and he has inspired generations of readers. Through his easy to read words and beautiful sceneries, he has drawn people into the world of literature, and has become a family tradition for, um, for people to grab um, from the collection of the doctor's work and read it to the newborns or the family. But you see, as we see Dr. Seuss through his books, there are other sides to the doctor that we don't usually see. For example, did you know that he was originally going to be an English professor? Theodore Geisel, that's his real name. Theodore was um, studying philosophy in Lincoln College located in Oxford, where he met his soon-to-be wife at the time, Helen Palmer. Now, Helen and um, one day came upon some of his own um, drawings that he did on the side. And uh, she was really taken aback by his style. She says, Theodore, you ought to drop out of college and pursue a career in the arts. And Theodore, Theodore was just like, oh, me? Drop out of college? Yeah. Ah, that's, uh, okay. But anyway, um, he eventually lodges. He goes back overseas to the United States and starts to own making cartoons and submitting them to um, the local newspapers. But eventually, his hard work will pay off. When he got his first job in the Flit Insect Repellent Advertising Agency. Show here. Now, uh, one of the things you should notice about this ad is even though it was so early, so early in his career, he already had his signature style down. And also, I think a very interesting thing to point out is the catchphrase, Quick Henry, the Flit. Now, you see, this, this catchphrase may not seem very important to you guys right now, but this was huge back in the day. It became so popular that it got cemented into the American vocabulary. And before you know it, you had children running around the house screaming, Quick Henry to Flit, every single time they saw an insect. But uh, as parents started to get more annoyed, uh, they started climbing, Dr. Seuss started climbing up the advertising, advertising ladder, and then he started drawing for Ford and Standard Oil. Now you see, part of his contract was he wasn't allowed to branch off into other bigger projects. However, Children's books were not part of those bigger projects, as he dabbled around in the field the rest of his history. Now, I want to point out something that's, um, has, that has been drawn to light very recently. About a year ago, Dr. Seuss Enterprises has been six of the following books shown on this slide, and underneath are the pictures that caused the uh, cease of publication. Now you can see they each contain Reese's car caricatures, and uh, they show depictions of Asian, African, Inuit, and Middle Eastern people. Now also, if you look at If I Run the Zoo, they have this song once, they have this one page where it reads, I'll, I'll hunt in the mountains of Zumba Matent, with helpers who all wear their eyes at a slant. Now you can see why this wouldn't apply today. Also additionally, in his advertising career, he also drew this for flint insect repellent. Now, you can obviously see um, how this is very troubling. Now also, to look at his racism, I want to pull up his political cartoon career. I see um, Dr. Seuss grew up in an American Jewish household, and he was um, often bullied for his heritage at school. Sometimes when he would be coming home, kids would throw rocks at him. And when um, Dr. Seuss figured out what Hitler was doing overseas, and how America at the time wasn't doing anything, he decided to take action. Putting away his typewriter, he enlisted into PM Magazine as political cartoonist, where he um, did cartoons all the way until the end of the war. He wouldn't touch a single children's book since. So, one of the main things he um, combated was the American First movement, saying how, told, as um, you can see, American First is symbolized by this grandmother who's reading tales of Adolf the Wolf and saying how poor children are dying, but it doesn't matter because they're not American. So, um, eventually Pearl Harbor happens and we get um, and we get drawn into the war. However, this song. Um, Dr. Seuss, you see, really, really hated Japanese people during this time, especially after Pearl Harbor. This is um, just a few days after the incident. And he, and he said that they were the big problem in our country because he, um, because he joined the Nazis, and he saw every single Japanese person as the enemy. Now, as you can see in this drawing, he represents them as cats, um, as drays, and how we need to remove them. Another thing, in um, February, um, a few months later, 
um, FDR instituted internment camps all along the California coast. Now you see, um, if you're not too familiar, um, these internment camps imprisoned Asian Americans um, inside of these camps. And, excuse me, they imprisoned them inside these camps um, just because of the race, so um, there wouldn't be any spies going around. And Dr. Seuss was all for that. He was openly against Japanese people. Now, as you can see, they're all drawn in, um, in a way to dehumanize the enemy. Now you see, most of these images are very troubling, and um, I apologize if they have um, if, if um, they have offended any of you guys. But um, you see, there's a good side to the story. You see, after World War II, after he picks up his typewriter, after he writes a few books, he starts to get a little better understanding of the Japanese culture. Eventually, he is able to travel there on a trip, and it was there that he met up with a few a few of the citizens there. Now. Um, while he was there, he started to realize that Japanese people are very similar to America if you take away all the cultural boundaries. And with his friend Sugi Nakamura, shown here, um, he came across the conclusion that a person is a person, no matter how small. So with this conclusion, he goes back to the United States and writes 40 years to who. Um, a lot of his friends consider this as a way of an apology for his racism at the time, and if you go home and flip to a copy of Gordon, in the first few pages, you will see that it's, um, that's dedicated to his friend who helps him see the light. A little later, during the 60s, during the Civil Rights Movement, the stages came out. Now, if you take away all the suicide factors about the stages, you come up with a story about racism. Now, you have the stages with stars, and you have the stages with those stars, and the stars are more privileged than the other, than the other stages. However, through the story, um, when they're all equal, they each try to get higher and higher over each other. And, um, and as you can see, as you know in the story, they go back and forth, and um, the trickster, Mr. McBean, um, takes all their money. Now, at the end of the story, they realize the same thing that Dr. Seuss did um, a decade before, that no matter what you are, no matter what your characteristics are, we are all the same species, and we should love and respect each other. And also, around in, um, a little later in the 70s, um, if you remember, Mulberry Street got banned for its depiction of um, uh, a Chinese man. Now this was the original drawing um, back in the 30s. However, his revision in the 70s caused um, this image. As you can see, it's a little different than um, the 30s style. Um, Dr. Seuss was racist for a time, and it can be shown in his um, work. However, he was able to redeem himself, and, um, and history has to judge him from there. Now, there's another side to Dr. Seuss that not many people are familiar with. You see, Dr. Seuss was very, very shy. He, um, when he was a little kid, he was in um, his Boy Scout troop selling war bonds for World War I. And, and uh, they did so good that they were going to get medals. And who was going to present the medals but Theodore Roosevelt? So, uh, you see, the problem was that Theodore Roosevelt only had seven medals, and there were eight children. So, after he hands out the medals, he slept with Dr. Seuss, who, and he has nothing. So he goes in and it's like, who's this kid? The whole crowd laughs, everyone's like, ah, you know. And he's forever scarred for life, and he's forever scarred of crowds. So, after he died, all of his artwork that he made privately was released, and it is what he called the Midnight Paintings. As you can see here, this is um, a little bit different than what you would see in a children's book. It's a lot more darker, also notice that the cat is smoking a cigarette, something that's a big no-no in his books. Um, yeah. This other one, I really like it. Um, it's called Self-Portrait of the Artist Worrying About His Next Book. Very relatable. Um, also notice how it's a lot darker than um, his usual books. And also this one, on this Dag of Eve. Notice how this, this piece almost feels kind of lonely in a way. And how it, it still contains a Susan style, but something that um, would not, was not seen being published in the day. Now that's not to see that all of his uh, art was bleak and dark. This is um, another one that's called Freebird, and it's an exploration of color. And this one, how did I get in here? <laughs> okay, well, jokes aside, um, Dr. Seuss, um, well, what, what do you do when you get mad at your neighbors? Um, you, you shake their fists at them, build the fence. Dr. Seuss drew them as birds. So, to make fun of his neighbors, he would uh, peek out through the window, and yeah, he'll just draw them as birds. Nothing more to say here. Um, not just that, he also liked to dabble in that abstract a little bit. Um, I just love these titles. Um, this one's called Joy Sleep in a Plumpkin Salmon. 
Now, uh, you can definitely see that um, Dr. Seuss really was expressing his creativity and privacy. Now, there are many sides of Dr. Seuss a lot of people don't see. The advertiser, the racist, the redemption, the artist, the introvert, and most importantly, Dr. Seuss praised the idea of imagination. He said that life without imagination is very, very bad, and it's very bleak. And we all need imagination and a little childlessness, even as we grow into adults. I hope you learned something new today about the doctor. Thank you.